who don't know me, my name is Su'an Helena Warwick and I'm the Attorney General of Samoa. I'm also the chair of the um, Sexual and Gender-Based Violence Working Group within PILON and I will be chairing this webinar today. So thank you for taking the time to attend this panel event, which marks the end of the four-part special measures webinar series presented by our working group. This, the special measure we will focus on today is the role of witness support officers in supporting vulnerable witnesses to give their full evidence in court. Uh, we're very fortunate today to have a panel um, to present our webinar today. And on our panel, we have three victim support officers uh, and two, two senior prosecutors and an in-house lawyer from an, a non-government organization in PNG in Papua New Guinea. So I'm honored to introduce our panel now. First up, we have from the Solomon Islands of the, uh, the Solomon Islands Office of the Public Prosecutor. And we have Ms. Helen Bennett, who's the witness support officer and Ms. Margaret Suifa Asia, who's the Chief Legal Officer. Then we also have from the Vanuatu Office of the Public Prosecutor, we have Ms. Bola Masao Bakalo, who is a Victim Support Officer. And from the Papua New Guinea Office of the Public Prosecutor, we have Ms. Leonie Miroy, who is a Victim Liaison Officer, and Ms. Mercy Tamate, who is a State Prosecutor. From Papua New Guinea, we are also joined by Ms. Darwin Dow, who is an in-house lawyer at the non-government organization, Family PNG. And I look forward to hearing more about Family PNG's work shortly. Okay, so to begin with, um, please let me invite the witness support officer, Ms. Helen Bennett, to share with us a case study which shows the impact of her role. Thank you very much, Helen, and the platform is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Hello, everyone. My name is Helen Bennett, and I work for the Office of the Director of Public Prosecutions in Solomon Islands as a witness support officer. I'm here today to speak to you about my role as a witness support officer. I will begin to talk, speak to you about my role being logistic orientated. Secondly, how my role has developed into being more witness orientated over time. I will then share with you a short case study of my work experience. When I started in 2014, my responsibilities in, uh, is mostly logistical based. It includes preparing summons and dispatching them to the police, assisting police with location of witnesses, meeting witnesses and placing them in accommodation. I pick up witnesses and drop them in court. I prepare and hand out witness allowances and I make sure that witness arrive in court for, in time for courts. I present the witnesses to the prosecutors for briefing and I arrange their return. At that time, my network was limited to police, the social welfare, the courts, and the accommodation and transport services. Mm -hmm. Around that time, I rarely mm -hmm. see witnesses as a support person in court. The, this role was given to the social welfare of police case officer. My dated when I was asked to sit in court with vulnerable witnesses in homicide and sexual offense. Other service providers through the state net network established in Solomon Islands. I began to appreciate the services available to help victims. After the Solomon Islands prosecutions and witness support officer guideline was launched in August 2014. 2021. Oh, 2021, sorry. 
I now have a well-defined role and responsibilities that assist me in my everyday duties. It has helped me to quickly identify issues that are normally faced by complainants of sexual offenses, thereby enabling me to make referrals to relevant support services as and when required. We now have the first meet and greet meeting with complainants. This session allows us to interact with vulnerable complainants. During that meeting, I also find out if the complainant needs to be referred to a support service or if they need protection orders. This is very important because I believe that making a referral early will help the complainant when giving evidence in court. I also explain to them briefly about our outdoor policy and ensures that witnesses know what to do or who to contact if they need help. <coughs> Excuse me. During with, with witness conferencing, I explain to them what usually happens in court, show them pictures of courtrooms, and on some occasion, when prosecutors request me to do, I take them to see inside of courtrooms. I accompany witnesses to waiting areas at the courts and sit with vulnerable witnesses when they give evidence in court. I, I also assist complainants with writing up victim impact statements and communicate the information of the outcome of this to the complainant or the carer directly or through the police officer, case officers. I'm going to share with you one of the many challenges that I face in my everyday duties in my case study. Mm -hmm. A job of a witness support officer is not always easy sailing. Each case has its own unique challenge. We sometimes have complaints of rape or incest cases in which the complainant does not show up in court because they have problems at home during the hearing. For example, recently we had an incest case. Complainants were two sisters. The incident happened in 2019. Matter was trialed this year. Both came in for witness conferencing one week before the trial date and were advised to come back on this particular date. On this particular date. Both were single before the incident and now are married. Complainant number two didn't show up in court that morning. The, the husband knew about the incident because he resided at the same area as the complainant when the incident happened. I went with the police officer to look for her and, and find out why she didn't come to the court. We found, her, we found her at home and she told me that she won't be coming, coming back for the trial and she wants us to close the case because she was having problems at home. She told me the other was not the same anymore. Her husband is not treating her well. He comes home very late and sometimes not all. She was scared her husband might divorce her. Ask me what will happen if he comes back. The prosecutor explained to her uh, no, the no drop policy and told her that her husband can be charged with interfering. So she asked me if I can speak with her husband and explain all this to him. Next day, the husband came with her. I sat with, sat with him and listened to him. And I then explained to him that what he is doing to the complainant is not helping at all. 
right now she needs his support because her family are no longer there to support her. Her mother is on the defendant's side. And for now, he's, a, he's one very important person that she can depend on for support. I told both of them about available services that they can go to see to help them deal with this. I offered to do bookings for them to see a counselor and told them to think about this and let me know if they need the referral. After we had that talk, the complainant came back next day for court, looking much better. And the husband even came to see her during lunch breaks. I will conclude by saying that our roles as, as support witness support officers, we are not counselors. And I recommend that some trainings for witness support officers to enable them to recognize witnesses that needs counseling or other support services. Thank you, Tomas. Thank you very much, Helen, um, for that very interesting presentation and especially on that case study, I'm sure uh, there will be lots of similarities between that case in, um, in the Solomons and in other jurisdictions as well. Um, but it's good to hear your experience and how um, your role as a witness support officer can assist. So I will, I will now invite uh, Ms. Bola Masalva Kalo to briefly talk about a typical day as a victim support officer in Manuatu. Uh, Ms. Bola, the floor is yours, the platform is yours, please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, good, good day, um, everyone, good afternoon. Uh, my name is uh, Bola. For those of you who don't know me, I, I am the Victim Support Officer here at the Office of the Public Prosecutor of Vanuatu. Um, <clears throat> I just wanted to start off by saying that I, this is a very new role. Uh, uh, it's the service first of its kind in Vanuatu. And I started uh, in October 19, 2020. So it's been a year, nine months in. So um, it's, uh, it's still trying to find its feet to stand. Um, <clears throat> I'd uh, just like to briefly share uh, how, uh, what my day uh, normally looks like. And um, probably if, if time permits, I would also probably share a very, um, like a, a short case study. Uh, so uh, my, my day uh, varies. I don't have a, a day where I follow a normal routine. Uh, sometimes my, my day will take a whole complete uh, turn, a new direction. Because uh, it, it pretty much depends on the cases that I receive from our case officer or from the prosecutor. Um, <clears throat> so it will go from it will be from uh, updating like reporting, and then uh, it will it will uh, for me to update the victims, and then uh, I will then have the prosecutor come in, and then would say, uh, "Opal, I need your assistance." Uh, if you can uh, assist me with one of my case, because I have trial in two weeks, uh, I need to get a medical report from a, from a doctor, like a psychiatrist or a psychologist, and I would have to stop with whatever I'm doing and then attend to the prosecutor's request. Uh, I'd make arrangements, uh, get in touch with the doctor, um, <clears throat> let him um, do a summary, let him know uh, what the prosecutor requests. Um, I uh, have the doctor make an appointment, uh, schedule the appointment for the victim, and then I get in touch with the victim. I let uh, the victim know and have them come to the office. And then I take them down to the um, hospital and um, wait for them while they have the session with the, with the doctor. And then from then, I have a debrief with the doctor and the doctor informs when he's gonna send the report, I come back to the office, let the prosecutor know. And when I do get the report, I send to the prosecutor. Uh, sometimes I do also receive uh, 
uh, from the victims coming from um, uh, other stakeholders, um, asking about updates of the of the case. Uh, I, 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 I see them and uh, just give them the time of day, just listen, listen to them and then uh, advise them accordingly. If I'm not sure about the case, I'll, I'll let them know that uh, I'll get the I'll get in touch with the prosecutor in, um, <clears throat> that's responsible for your case, uh, get the update and I'll, I'll come back to you um, as soon as I get the update from the prosecutor responsible for your case. So, so, that, so the day, typical day for a, as a victim support officer, uh, I don't have a, like, a, <clears throat> how do I say it? Uh, everything is uh, like, I come in, this is normally what you do. It's basically, it depends on uh, the case files I receive uh, during the day and also from the prosecutor. So it, it, it varies. But uh, I just want to express appreciation to Paula for sharing her experiences uh, with us through this webinar. Um, it's, it's very helpful uh, as, as prosecutors to hear, to get the insights on the roles of these witness support officers and how they support the, the role of prosecutors by helping out with uh, preparing the witnesses and supporting the witnesses throughout the, the cases. But now we enter into the panel discussion part of um, today's event. But I can uh, start with a question today that's already been sent through to us. And this is a question for Darwin, Darwin Down. So uh, Darwin, are you online? Yes, I see. Um, Yes. Noting book, the, the question I have for, for Darwin is, um, is this. Noting most of our audience will not have interacted with Family PNG before, would you be able to briefly ex explain how Family PNG operates? Thank you. Yes, I, I will briefly uh, explain um, Family PNG. So Family PNG was established in 2014. Uh, it's a local NGO and uh, we provide case management to survivors of family sexual violence. So basically we assist survivors to access services from government agencies, such as the police, uh, courts, family support center at the hospital, welfare and safe houses. We are currently operating in three locations. Uh, in PNG, our head office is in Ley, uh, Morabe Province, uh, Port Mosby, the capital city, and Goroka up in the Eastern Highlands of this country. Family PNG has a uh, four main target population that we attend to uh, because gender-based violence is a broad topic and we have sized it down. Uh, we assist intimate partner violence, survivors of intimate partner violence, child abuse, sexual violence, and sorcery accusation related violence. Those who have been accused and tortured. Apart from assisting survivors, we also provide support to our referral partners service providers that we work with closely for our survivors or our clients that we are registered under our case management. And we do have an allocated budget to provide that support to our partners. Apart from that, we also support our uh, referral partners such as the safe houses, human rights defenders, and our local civil society organizations in carrying out the work they, that they do. So Family PNG, we have uh, two lawyers. I'm one of them uh, based in Ley, and my other colleague is in Port, Port Mosby. Uh, basically, we assist uh, the case workers in reviewing their application for interim protection orders uh, under the Family Protection Act 2013. We provide legal advice to uh, the clients, case workers, our partners, and we also advocate for uh, our clients to partners to program. Anyway, which um, I, I was I was 
very interested to hear that they're not just a, a support services, but also a legal center that provides legal advice. I just wanted to ask if, um, and I'm sure everyone has a similar question, whether they are a legal aid funded service or uh, how, how they get funded to provide such, um, such a broad range of services for witnesses and, and uh, survivors, which is fantastic. Okay, so I have a question for um, Leonie Miroy, the victim liaison officer from uh, Papua New Guinea. Leonie, having just heard from Helen and Bola's brief case studies, how, how does this compare to your experiences? Um, hello, everyone. Um, as um, I've been introduced, I'm Leonie, I'm a victim liaison officer. I'm based in Lay with so um, more of a province. Okay, so I started with the office in 2013. Um, with the new criminal code, the amendment to our criminal code, it provided the section 21A provided for the, um, provided for victim impact statements uh, that caused the office to create a position, a victim liaison officer for a victim liaison officer. So I joined in 20, um, 13. And basically what I do is um, just the same, uh, would, would be similar to what Margaret and Bola do. Um, just like Bola, I don't have, a, say, a, a schedule. I, I, I just work because um, when I walk into the office and then if a lawyer has a case during that day, then they ask me to either conference the witness. Um, basically, conferencing witnesses is not like for my part, it's not for me to ask them questions about what they uh, what the questions that are going to be asked of them in court, but more or less getting to know them, getting to see if they're able to um, stand in court and talk uh, and give their evidence. Um, see if they're confident to talk in court. Um, I also provide um, support, as in I do sit with the witnesses in court. Um, I do work with the family, uh, with sexual offenses mostly, but I also work with in other, um, like it, my role covers a broad range of, um, um, yeah, broad range. So it depends on which, uh, what case a lawyer sees the need for my service or my help. I also have um, a network. Uh, Family PNG is a major part of our network. Uh, with contacting witnesses, I don't contact witnesses. Neither does our, um, neither do our lawyers, uh, the prosecutors. Um, contacting witnesses is from the arresting officer. So we ask. So our communication is with police and the arresting officer or investigator in charge of that um, matter. We contact them to bring the witnesses to us. So um, that's basically how we contact with our witnesses. Um, we do provide, um, we don't provide counseling. Uh, we do re referrals. I do referrals uh, if I feel like a witness, for example, is not able to, uh, is not confident enough to um, give evidence before the court, then the meet and greet is not successful from our end, then I'd have to send them out to either family PNG or welfare services to and other services to see if they can bring out, um, make the witness confident. So that's one of the things that I do. That I do. Um, another thing that I do is um, victim impact statements. So from our office, we've seen that the victim impact statement is very important. It does influence sentencing. Um, most of the time judges do, um, the court does take the victim impact statement into account when they're doing, the, when they're giving out sentences. So um, most of the times with uh, sexual offenses and other serious offenses, which our lawyers or our prosecutors identify, if they identify a need for um, victim, impact, victim impact statements, then we do victim impact statements. Uh, victim impact statements is not limited to uh, me conducting interviews to get um, information. 
it's all it's I can ask the victim to provide a statement. However, most times with the literacy rate, then um, I do interviews and then I produce the victim impact statements. And those victim impact statements are submitted in court during sentencing. Uh, that's basically what I do in a day. Um, with the meet and greet for us, meet and greet is not just a one day thing. We do meet and greet over a period of time. It's basically to get to know our witnesses. And it's, if, if it's a child, um, it's very important that for myself that the child is really confident. So for myself, it's just the meet and greet. The process is either playing games or just getting to know each other. And if I, if my time is limited, then I give it hours. I talk to you for, for I talk to the child for about two hours or one hour, and then I send them away, and then they come back in the day. It's probably I can do that throughout the day. So my day can um, comprise of just only meet and greet. Um, other times I have we have walking walking clients. They just walk into the office because we are part of the. Vic uh, Family and Sexual Violence Action Committee. Um, that's basically made up of every stakeholder. So we have this networking that's in process in our province in Morobe. So um, it's very it's a very successful um, networking um, yeah network. So um, when we have um, clients that just walk in, then I do referrals. So if I see that they need because we don't deal with civil matters, then I probably refer them to public solicitor's office or um, if they need to go to welfare offices and other services or probably family PNG. So I guess that's basically what I do. But it does most times it does like interacting with witnesses that clients does take up a lot of time. And there is no there's not a certain um, schedule that I follow actually. So I guess that's basically it. Thank you very much, uh, Viomi, that's um, for sharing that with us. I, can I just also ask how many victim liaison officers in your office? Because it so sounds like you can spend quite a few hours with one victim. Um, in Lay, there's only one. Uh, we only have one, and that's just me. And um, we have uh, 10 districts that we have cases coming from. So in a day, in a week, it's quite full some days. So yeah, we have people lining out outside to access the service. Thank, thank you, Leonie. It sounds like there's more, there's work for more than one officer. Um, uh, yeah, well actually, done. yeah, there is. Yeah, you do. Um, Okay, so I have a, another question here. This is a question for um, Margaret from uh, in Honihara. Um, Margaret, as a as a prosecutor, what positive yes. experiences have you have you had or seen when witnesses are supported by victim support officers or witness liaison officers? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, yeah, so. Like Helen in her presentation said, like previously her role was really logistic oriented. So it meant that prosecutors sometimes go out of their way to go and meet the victims or the complainants at their home, or we go out of our way to communicate with police and instruct them to bring the complainant to the office. Um, and so, Having Helen in play in her position and role is has really taken a load off for prosecutors, so that she does all that arrangements, um, logistic arrangements, as well as arranging to speak with the carers or the complainants, or even go out to meet the complainant, bring them in, or one of us meet and greet. She introduces them to the process. We have brooches available to assist her. Uh, talk about court processes, talk about the, the um, parties who, we, who will be involved in the court hearing. So she does most of that and that's really helped us prosecutors so that our work is more concentrated on working with our case files, preparing our cases, speaking to uh, witnesses, preparing them to go to court. 
So that has been the positive experience having Helen, her role in place um, for me or for us as a prosecutor, as well as the complainants or the witnesses generally respond well to us, to the prosecutors, because they've, they've been looked after by Helen, accommodated, they've, been re they've received the allowances, um, uh, they've been transported to and from, so that when they come to meet us in the office, they're well settled and they respond well to us when we want to take them through their the briefing. And even when, when we go to court, they appear confident that they are ready to go and give their evidence. Thank you, Madam Chair. Sorry, thank well, you very much for that, um, Margaret. That was very um, helpful. Um, it's good to hear the very positive experiences and I'm sure every prosecutor listening uh, wants to have a Helen. What's the biggest change you're seeing in your job and will that change continue on? Um, thank you, Madam Chair, for the question. Um, <clears throat> we've just had a, um, a new practice direction where, um, if, uh, where when case files come through at the office of the public prosecutor and from the case officer to victim support officer, I have within 88 hours to get in touch with the, with the victim and um, uh, set, a, set a date for them to come in for meet and greet. Um, and, and, and then uh, go on from there. So the new practice direction has uh, been very helpful. Um, it was endorsed in um, April. So it's, um, it's a process, uh, mm -hmm. this, uh, and which, which means that the uh, victim support officer will have a lot more cases because at first, uh, how uh, things were done here before this new practice direction, I would just wait for the prosecutors who would need my assistance, then they would come and then uh, I would assist them. But with this new practice direction, the file are coming through straight from the case officer. And then I am engaged in uh, directly from the get go. And I have 48 hours to get in touch with the victim. So I, the new practice direction is, uh, is a very good um, <clears throat> a process in place. Uh, good, it's gonna expose, uh, especially as a victim support officer, a lot more cases uh, and a lot more mm -hmm. getting to be exposed to a lot more uh, uh, na different natures of different cases and uh, different victims. Uh, um, yes, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, thank you for sharing that, uh, Paula. That, that's, um, it's interesting to see the developments and how it can improve the direct services to a victim support officer. So well done to Vanuatu for that um, progress. Yeah, I, I see it's, it's, a really, it's a really interesting question. I think most um, other members will be interested in, in getting an answer for this as well. If um, our colleagues, our panelists from uh, Solomon and Vanuatu can assist us. So a question from Fiji Women's Rights Movement in Fiji. So we're not sure if our ODPP has victim support officers and we as a local feminist NGO are curious as to how VSOs were introduced into the ODPP, both in Vanuatu and Solomon Islands, as we see that this is something that Fiji will definitely benefit from having, given that we see an overwhelming majority of sexual violence offenses are committed against women and girls. Um, can I ask our colleagues from uh, Solomon's first, if you want to address that question? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, if Helen can assist along with answering that question. First of all, it was during the Ramsey period when the Australian um, uh, under, you know, Ramsey, when we had the ethnic tension and then Ramsey uh, regional support from Australia and other regional countries came in. Helen was working with, um, what's, what do you call it? I was working with a unit mm -hmm. that deals with witnesses for the ethnic tensions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it was there in 2006 and after they left, mm -hmm. and then I came to DPP. So after Ramsey left, DPP adopted an establishment where um, it's called witness liaison officers. Yeah. 
um, and then Helen filled that position with three others or so. Yeah. And that's how it started back in 2014. 2014. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I, I, that's really interesting as well. Uh, I think for um, now that we've seen and heard from uh, how it has worked in PNG and Solomon Islands and also in Vanuatu, for other countries um, tuning in, it's, it's probably a matter you can take up directly with your Attorney General's office or even your um, prosecutor's office to see how they can uh, advocate for getting victim support offices to assist in that way. And, and then perhaps they can also link um, some support to the NGOs involved or working in the same mm -hmm. space. Perhaps I can ask one last uh, question to all our, our panelists. This is based on an audience question that was submitted to us beforehand. I want to ask the panel, how important has networking been in your role, both at the national and regional level? And are you able to share any strategies you plan to use to strengthen your network? Hi, Madam Chair. Um, coming from our, our, our side of things, um, networking is important. First of all, I'm speaking for Helen, uh, Helen's experience. It's important for her to to strengthen her relationship with other um, other service providers, to you know, to make her work a lot easier to supporting um, witnesses, not just vulnerable witnesses, but other witnesses. Can you turn over? Other witnesses in other cases as well. Um, so that she was saying in her presentation that she was um, introduced to the SafeNet um, networking here. She met other service providers and was able to identify with those service providers to help her in her work when she's doing referral. Um, so that's not nationally within or internally here. In terms of regional um, networking, it is very important because um, you see how other, other countries will now recognize the need for having a witness support officer in the ODPP um, to support SGBV cases, vulnerable witnesses. Now, my project, the Prosecutions and Witness Officers Support Guideline, um, was now is now recognized regionally, and it's been adopted by Pilon when we're in a panelist working um, panelist advisory group working on one for the region, and that's why networking is very important, so that we can share our experiences share our ideas and see how we can adopt those ideas and implement it um, in, in our country. Um, so that's basically how I can answer that question. In terms of strategies, um, to really strengthen our networking, we need to have, I was thinking on the top of my head, a meeting, um, probably a regular meeting for witness uh, liaison officers, like we have Bola, um, Leone, Helen here, and maybe, you know, it can extend to other countries who are interested um, to know this role and responsibility, how they can also adopt a similar um, a position or establishment in, within their office. So that um, that's something I hope um, Kilon will, will pick up an, a strong network for them, for the witness base in offices. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Margaret. And I think that's a very good point um, for Pilon to note, to take a note of how we can um, how we can provide support to the victim liaison officers by enabling more regional networking and, and meetings uh, whenever opportunities come up. You know, like, like today's webinar is a, is, a, is a good example. We get to hear and share the experiences from the three countries that have them. Um, I'm just going to check if there's any more last questions, because I think we're coming to the end of our time that uh, um, we Madam have allocated. Yeah. There's a, a hand up from Salote. Uh, she may have a question. Yes, Salote. Hi, thank you. <laughs> thank you. I'll just be very brief. Um, hi, I'm with Child Protection in Fiji, working for the Pacific. Um, I'm a national of Fiji, and um, just want to share how network is very key 
we support governments. And in Fiji, I'll just share very quickly, we support the Ministry of Women, Children, Poverty Alleviation, the police also with, the, and the police forensics who have mm -hmm. developed um, SAE kit, sexual assault examination kit. And they've developed a juvenile, uh, a child specific measured one so that with, when they found that using forensics has enabled uh, suspects to, to plead guilty, which prevents uh, women and children from retelling or re-traumatizing themselves, giving verbal evidence in court. Um, and the, net, the networking is so key for regional too, for us to share good practices, what's working, what's not working. Um, the other thing is one of the DPP years ago developed a guideline on how to support uh, victims as uh, complainants. We also support the Sexual Offences Unit Police to ensure that they're vic it's a victim-centered investigation questioning approach. Um, and there's many other good things happening to ensure that the children and victims tell their stories authentically, are comfortable and are ready. Um, to help the courts, the prosecutors um, find uh, the just end outcome when there's a, an offense of sexual abuse. I leave it there. We also, I think, I, I know that all the other countries have a national coordinating committee for children. This is a good place to get the multi sector approach to support prosecutors and the police to get the evidence and the work that they, the the proper um, information they need to do their work as well as they're doing right now and even better. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Salote, for sharing that. And I, I'm, I'm sure if other um, any other attendees and all panelists want to reach out to you, um, we'll be able to get the contact details because that was a lot of very helpful information. So thank you for sharing that on this webinar. Um, and I think that actually now brings us to the end of our questions for today. Um, and the end of our, and it's actually the end of our, oh, thank you. Saloti has now posted her email address in the chat group. So the, um, anyone wanting to get in contact can take a note of that now while it's up. Um, so I just want to say this is now the end of our special measures series of the um, for PILON members and friends. A recording of this webinar will be circulated to all attendees with the, along with the finalized posters from our graphic recorder. You can also watch the whole special measures series on the PILON YouTube channel. Oh, wow, I didn't know we had a YouTube channel. Huh? That's nice to know. So thank you for joining us throughout the series. Thank you for your questions and the valuable feedback you've provided. We will again send out a very short survey after today's webinar and would be very grateful if everyone could use it to provide feedback. A link to the survey is also now in the uh, chat, or it should be very shortly. If you would like further information or assistance with the implementation of special measures in your country, please provide your contact details in the survey and information can be provided for you. So before we finish, I want to note that the working group is now looking beyond the courtroom at ways to support vulnerable witnesses throughout the entire prosecution process. We are developing regional guidelines to assist prosecutors and witness support officers to best support vulnerable witnesses in SGBV uh, cases. To find out more, we encourage you to get in contact with your working group country representative. Alternatively, you can email the PILON Secretariat and Sasai and Rosie who are on the line will ensure you get the information you need. So the, there was a question about the YouTube channel detail that's now just being posted in our chat. You can um, download those details now. So on that note, I wish to thank all our fantastic panelists today. Thank you for sharing your stories. Thank you for taking the time to prepare for this webinar. And I wish all of our participants a great weekend. Thank you and to Faso for.